Okay, so unit five, we have these four lessons we're going to cover in three days. These two lessons we're going to cover in one day. This is a one-off lesson. This is a one-off lesson. We're going to talk about E's and natural logs. We're talking about E first. It's like pi. Pi is just the circumference of a circle divided by a diameter. E is done by taking the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 over x to the x. That's what we use for continuous compounding. Okay, this is used for kind of like compounding interest. Only if x is approaching infinity, boom, we have like a, a compounding that is always happening. It's continuous compounding. Let's go ahead and check this. It's fun to check this using our calculator. Get out your calculators. And I want you to first type in E and figure out what the decimal approximation is for E. We've got to find where E is. It's right above the division symbol, right? And I go second E. You also have E to the power of somewhere. Over here above log, you have E to the first power. You can write that. Good. Now, go ahead and plug in a huge number into this expression, like 10,000 or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And watch how you'll get something very, very close to E. So 1 plus 1 divided by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 to the 1, 2, 3. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, there you go. As x approaches infinity, our value is going to get closer and closer to 2.718281828 repeated, I believe. Okay, there you go. Very interesting, right? Well, E is a huge number that we use when we're talking about exponential functions like e to the x. Y equals e to the x is a function used frequently. And it looks like this. Okay, that's y equals e to the x. Now, y equals log x is the inverse. Of e to the x. Logs and E's undo each other. Okay, if this has a point, you know, X, Y, this will have the same point, but it'll just be flip-flop. It'll be the Y, then the X. So this is the point zero, 1. Log is going to have the point 1, 0. And if we flip-flop all of those points, we end up with this function. This is a function that grows exponentially quickly. Exponential growth. This function ends up growing exponentially slowly. Exponential, that's not how you spell it, I missed an N. Exponential slow growth. Okay, and it's important to be able to find values of logs without using your calculator. Now we'll be able to check these using our calculator. Like the log of 1, the log of E. Okay. Well, I can do this, and you may do this in the future is I'm going to say, I don't know what the log of 1 is, or I don't know what the log of E is. It's a mystery. I'll say it's a mystery number. Maybe it's a question mark. Maybe it's a Y, some mystery number. Well, E to the power is going to undo what log is doing to number 1. I could take E to the power of both sides. Sometimes I use a carrot just to denote that. It's not multiplying, it's taking e to the power of both sides. And if I do that, e and log will undo each other and just leave me with the 1. And I'll get e to the y. 
Well, this is a little bit easier to manage. I know what number y is such that e to the y is 1. What does y have to be so that this number to a power is 1? 0, exactly. That is why log of 1 is 0. That is something we either need to have memorized or we need to be able to find that the log of 1 is 0. We call that the natural log. I will just shorten it by saying it's the log. Okay, L-O-G log, that is uh, going to undo 10 to a power. So it's just a log with a base 10. So same with this one, log of E. I don't know what log of E is. I say it's equal to some mystery number. Well, I take E to the power of both sides. E to the log, that kind of undoes each other, and it just leaves me with E is equal to E to the Y. What does Y have to be? 1. It's another thing. E to the log of E is 1. Now we get into others where we have e to different powers that we need to be comfortable with. It's going to be easy for us to work with logs if we know uh, some values to plug in that we know what we will get out of. So we should be comfortable finding the log of 1 over e and the log of e cubed. I will show you how if you take the log of e to any power, it will just equal P, the power. Why is that? I can take Y, take E to the power of both sides. Here, the log and E will cancel. I end up with E to the P is equal to Y to the P. I mean, E to the Y. So, Y has to equal P. So, this means... If I have the log of e to any power, it's just going to be that power. The log of e cubed is just 3. Simple. The log and e essentially cancel each other out. just leaves me 3. What about the log of 1 over e? What's that going to be? Negative 1 is correct because I can write 1 over e as e to the negative first. which is negative 1. Okay, we need to be comfortable with these. The only one that is not e to a power is 1, but I could write that as e to a power, right? How can I write 1 as e to a power? E to the 0. Thank you, Mr. Ramos. That's perfect. Watch. If I write this as e to the 0, that confirms things. At the log of 1, is just zero. It's the same thing as e to the zero. Okay, good. So we need to be comfortable with those. We need to be comfortable with solving equations with e to the x and log x. If I have e to the x is equal to y, or log of x is log of k is equal to l, and say I want to solve for x, or say I want to solve for k, we kind of already worked with the log of k is equal to l, to get rid of the log, I would take e to the power of both sides, giving me k is equal to e to the l. I've solved for k. Now notice it's e to the power. It's not e times the value. It's a different kind of algebraic technique. Over here, to get rid of the e and to just give me the x, I will take the log of both sides. It's not log times. Log is a function, kind of like a trig function, where it has to be taken of something. So it's a log of this stuff. So all the stuff inside there would be treated like, treated like stuff inside a trig function. It can't move around that much. This will just be x equals log of y. Okay? Knowing that, we should be able to solve these two equations for x fairly simply, fairly quickly. Log x minus 2 is equal to 0. E to the x minus 3 is equal to 0. Actually, why don't I make it a little bit more difficult over here and make it 
six. Okay, go ahead and solve those for x. So I just add 2, I have log x equals 2, then to get rid of the log, e to the power of both sides, x equals e squared. It could kind of be figured out just by looking at the original equation, knowing that I need 2 minus 2 is equal to 0. Well, you know that e squared is 2, so boom. Okay? But it is helpful to go here and take e to the power to get here. The next one, I'd add 3, and I would have to divide by 6 first to isolate the e to the x. And then I would take the natural log of both sides, giving me x is equal to the natural log of a half. Okay, should look like that. It's the natural log of a half. Any questions on those? I know that teachers, your pre-cal teacher, might have taught you different ways to deal with logs and e's, but I like to keep it simple and think about it as like an algebraic process where you're doing something to the both sides rather than I know there's some manipulations that you could do, some kind of circle method. I don't really know that method. Okay, so more algebraic this way. All right, good. So we need to be comfortable with that because we will be solving certain equations set equal to zero. Now, let's talk about finding derivatives using our calculator. This is a technique that we need to know for the future, for an AP test where we have a calculator question. It's important to know, and I'll talk about this in the future, that when we take the AP test, we will have a calculator section. However, there's maybe half of the problems on the calculator section you will actually use your calculator on. Maybe even less than that. So the whole calculator section is deceptive in that you think you have to use your calculator for all the questions and ends up being not that many. But it's something that we'll need to know how to do, so we're going to use this lesson to help us introduce this. We'll find the derivative of log x at specific numbers. Now, your calculator can find tangent slopes at specific numbers. There's two ways to do it. Okay? It does not give you the actual derivative function, unless you have a TI-89. If you have a TI-89, it, it has programmed in derivative rules. For the TI-84+, plus, this guy, or the TI-84, it knows how to find tangent slopes by taking two points really, really close to each other and finding the secant slope between those two points. And they say, okay, that's the tangent slope. So when we first introduced derivatives and we talked about slope between two points infinitely close together, that's what your calculator does to find a tangent slope of log x, okay? Two ways to do it. We could first in our y equals, graph the function. So I can go in y equals and graph the natural log of x. And let's zoom standard. And I get that. Now it's very important to realize that x has to be greater than 0 for the natural log function. You have 0, you have an undefined value. Okay. Now, we've gone to calculate before in math class, but you should have noticed maybe that number 6 is something that is 
familiar to us now that we're in calculus. It's dy dx. I can click that and then choose an x value, say 1, to find the tangent slope. This is the tangent slope to log x at 1. It's 1.000003. What do you think the slope is actually? It's probably 1, right? This goes to show you that your calculator does an approximation. It takes two points very, very close to each other. Well, sometimes the points won't be close enough to each other to give us an exact value. Instead, it's giving us a secant slope, which is an approximation. Okay? It's not using a derivative rule. It's using two points. Okay? So the tangent slope actually is 1. So we'd say f prime at 1 is 1. That is one way to do it. The other way, which I use more frequently than that, is in your home screen. Everybody go to your home screen. Do you have this in the 81? Do you have the dy dx? Yeah, you don't have calculate. So you're going to use one of my calculators for this stuff. That's good for, you know, regular calculations, but uh, for tangent slopes, you're going to have to use this guy. Log x, and then calculate as above trace. Okay, so in your home screen, you will go math, and... You go down in the first column of math to math 8, and you see n derived. If you go to n derived, either this notation pops up or n derived pops up. Everybody go there. Does anybody see n derived in their calculator? You see n derived in your calculator. You see n derived in your calculator. Okay, I will give you the specific way to type it in for you guys in a second. For everybody who sees this notation, it's very intuitive. It's take the derivative with respect to x of the function at the specific value. Let's do it at 2. And again, notice what your calculator did. It gave you an approximation because it's using two points. Sometimes those two points aren't close enough together to give you an exact value, but you can go ahead and assume that f prime of 2 is a half. Now, you end derivers, you'll type this in. Your function, comma, with respect to x, comma, the value that you wish to find the derivative of, okay? So let's find the derivative at 3 and 4, whatever, whichever method that you guys choose. Uh, n derive, the function, always x, and then the number. For you, Miss Willie. I actually have. Okay, you got the notation. Good. So, what do we get for f prime of 3? One third? What do we get for f prime of 4? So, what do you think the slope generating function is for log x? f prime of x would be what? <coughs> 1 over x is correct. Okay? We just found the derivative of log x, 1 over x. This is a new derivative rule that you have to have memorized. That's the derivative of log x is 1 over x.
the tangent slope generator for log x is 1 over x. Let's do the same kind of process for e. Let's find the derivative using our calculator for e at 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So again, you can either graph it or you can do it in your home screen. Sometimes in your home screen, uh, I mean, both ways are quick. Once you plug it in once in your home screen, you can just reselect and change the number. How do you reset? Oh, go up, up, enter. Then left, two. What do we get for f prime of zero? Questions? Oh, yeah, it's right there. And then you would put in x. Oh, yeah, I think it's x. Yep, x. x. And then here, <coughs> in between the parentheses, you would plug in the function. E to the x. And then you would plug in the x value. Cool. So that's in your home screen. What do we get for f prime of zero? One. What was f prime of one? It ended up being 2.718, right? Two eight. What do we get for f prime of two? We ended up getting e squared. How did you know it was e squared? It's kind of like guessed, right? The calculator didn't give it to you, did it? No. Good. So if I did math 8 d d x of e to the x, when x is 2, or you could use this in uh, your y equals. Oh, why did I press graph? Enter. I got 7.389, right? Do you guys get 7.389? Good. And then for cubed, it's like 20 point something. Right? Well, Mr. Keneally figured out that this is just E. This is just E squared. And this is just E cubed. What do you think the tangent slope generating function, F prime of X, is? e to the x. Fascinating that the tangent slope generator is just itself. That means if you look at a point on the graph of e to the x, the y coordinate is also giving you the tangent slope value everywhere. If you look at e cubed, well, the tangent slope of e cubed is e cubed. Wow. That's why Another reason why E is so fascinating, because it produces its own tangent slope. Okay? So this is another thing you have to have memorized. That the derivative tangent slope generator for E to the X is E to the X. The final thing that you have to have memorized, however, it is hit or miss whether or not you will be tested on it on an AP test, is the derivative of A to the X is a to the x times the natural log of a. It's almost like the same rule for e to the x. If you think about it, using this rule, the derivative of e to the x would be e to the x log e. Does that confirm with this? Why, Mr. Buckner? Because log of e is just 1. Exactly. So you can actually think about just this rule for all situations when you have x to a power. It's just when you have e to the x, you have log e, which is just 1, which just goes away. So sure, memorize this and you have everything, but understand that that's the shortcut and you can just go right there.
All right, well now let's practice taking derivatives of logs and e's. First we got to deal with something like this, where we have e to a power. That might not just be x, like e to the x squared. What rule do you think we'll have to use to take the derivative of e to the x squared? <laughs> did you not sign? Did you get signed up for right, somebody else? Take them off the list. Thanks. Yeah, you'd pass out if you did that. Yeah. Okay. What rule do you think we need for this? We need the chain rule. This is a composition. This is e to a power. And then inside the power is something other than x. I need to have the product of the derivative of e to the power, which is e, remember the chain rule, times the derivative of the inside, which is 2x. That gives me this. Now, what about log of something other than x? We know that the derivative is 1 over x, right? But let's remember in a chain rule, we have an outside and the inside. The derivative of the log of stuff, I will say, is 1 over stuff. It's not going to be 1 over x. It's going to be 1 over my stuff. Then the derivative of my stuff, I can find 12x squared minus 1. This ends up being 1 over 4x cubed minus x times 12x squared minus 1. Don't forget the outs and the ins when dealing with compositions. We haven't dealt with chains in a while. Some... But last unit, you know, we were doing implicit things. It's unit before, we had simpler functions. We're back to having some composition. Okay? So, in general, if you were to take the derivative of e to a function using the chain rule, your outside is that, the inside is that. The derivative would be that times f prime. Okay, the derivative of e to a power is just e to the power. So this would be e to the f of x times f prime of x. For log of some function, the outside is the log. The inside is the f of x. The derivative of the outside is 1 over. The derivative of the inside is f prime. So this would be 1 over f of x times f prime of x. You can move the f prime to be up here if you choose. Your book will do it always. The last one is the a to the f of x. It would just be a to the f of x log a times f prime of x. It's very similar to the e to the x. Okay? You don't have to have these memorized so long as you understand the chain rule. So let's practice. Find the derivative of e to the negative x and log of 5x.
careful. Good. Nah, I can't do that. It's E to a power. Good. Good. Yep. We understand the chain rule. We understand we have the outside, which is the e to a power. The inside, which is the negative x. The derivative of the outside would be e to the power. It's just the same thing. The derivative of negative x is negative 1. So you get e to the negative x times negative 1, which is just negative e to the negative x. Uh, I should probably write this correctly because they're asking for the derivative. So I will say that f prime equals negative e to the negative x. Good. G, outside and inside. The outside is log. The inside is 5x. The derivative of log is 1 over. The derivative of 5x is 5. What is fascinating is that you'll have 1 over 5x times 5 ends up just being 1 over x in this situation. Okay? Okay. More? Don't forget a to the x. Let's do these two. We have 5 to the 3x squared plus 2x minus 5, and then we have 2 to the e to the negative x. All that changes between this one and e to a power is you have the natural log of the base number. So you would say that if your outside was 5 to the power, its derivative would be 5 to the power log 5. That would be the derivative of the outside. You also have the inside. 3x squared plus 2x minus 5. The derivative of that is simple, just using our power rule. Okay, let's make sure that derivative is correct. Now the other one actually has kind of three pieces going on. You have the 2 to the power, and you have e to the power, and then you have that power in e. So you have to take the derivative of the 2 to the power, then the derivative of the e to the power, and then the derivative of the negative x. Watch what the derivative looks like. 2 to the e to the x 
times e to the negative x times negative 1. All in a row like that using the chain rule. What's the log 2? Thank you. Just a little couple of different problems, like if f is this, find f prime. b is not a uh, variable, it's a constant. So take the derivative of b e to the negative bx with b being a number. A little bit tricky. You could have a log of E in there, but the log of E is 1, which is why we exclude the natural log of E when we have E to the X. Okay. So you could have this. L N E. but we know that this is just one. Okay, now let's find the, remember this notation means the third derivative of this. Another kind of question you may see in the future. Okay, I should get negative cos x plus negative 2 over x cubed. Remember, you do not have to use the quotient rule when you have 1 over x or 2 over x squared or something like that. You just rewrite it and then you use the power rule. Derivative of x to the negative first is negative 1 x to the negative second. The derivative of x to the negative second is negative 2 x to the negative third. Okay, uh, this was a minus, this became a plus because it was negative one times the negative, 
and then this one back to being a minus. Okay, good. We've practiced derivatives. Now, we're going to go back and do some of the problems that we did in like unit three, uh, a little bit in unit two, but with ease and locks. So, unit two, uh, we already did those, aren't we? Unit two problems like this. Find the x comma y locations of the horizontal tangents to this function. Of course, we know, and what I didn't do is we could plug in values into all these derivatives. Okay? And if we plug in values sometimes, unless it's like the log of 1 or the log of an easy value, sometimes you can't simplify them. Okay? If you are plugging in e, you have the log of e, make sure it's 1. If you end up plugging in 1 and you have the log of 1, make sure you understand that the log of 1 is 0. And when you plug in and get specific values, they're not difficult. But horizontal tangents to this function. Okay, so let's go ahead and write that function down, and let's find when the derivative equals zero. This is a solid unit two question. Now we have a product, so let's go ahead and take the derivative of that using the product rule. And then we set that equal to zero and we solve. We'll have to discuss how we solve that correctly. So again, let's make sure we can apply the product rule correctly. It's the derivative of the first piece times the second plus the derivative of the second piece times the first. This is set equal to zero. Ideas for how I can solve this. Could distribute the e to the x. I'd have lots of e to the x's all over the place. Would that help me? Maybe, but I would do something else. Like it. Good. I have e to the x in both terms. That's a great thing about e to the x. When we have the derivative, it's the same thing. I'm going to typically, whenever I'm taking derivatives and ask to solve, factor out that common e to the x term. It's important that we do this. Then notice that I can factor this that is left over. Giving me e to the x times x plus 3 times x minus 1. Now I know, since I have a product equal to zero, that when x is negative three, definitely works. When I have x equals one, that definitely is going to make the left side zero. So those are my two answers from those two pieces. But what about e to the x? What number do I plug in for x here to make this zero? It never equals zero. It only approaches zero if I plug in negative infinity. I'll have one over e to the positive infinity, which is approaching zero. But this actually never equals zero. Not only never zero, but it's always positive, which will be helpful. Moving into unit uh, three type problems. So here are my locations of my horizontal tangents, uh, negative three and one. Okay, that's it. We factor out the e to the x, and it's like we can forget about it. Yes. Uh, yeah, to find the points, right? So I plug in negative 3, I get 9 minus 3, which is 6, times e to the negative third. So I'd have negative 3 times 
e to the negative third or 6 over e cubed. I plug in 1, I get negative 2e, so I'd have 1, negative 2e. Those would be the points where you'd have horizontal tangents, okay? Now, notice I got e's here. It's okay. Can't simplify it. It's just a value, okay? I would rewrite this maybe as 6 over e cubed. All right, good. Next problem. This is almost kind of like a unit 2 problem. It's a little bit more complicated. It's a different kind of problem that you haven't seen yet. And we need to be prepared for this type of problem for a quiz or a test. So let's write down that problem. f of x is equal to x squared e to the kx. k is a constant. To what value k does f have a critical point when x is a half? Who remembers a critical point, what that definition was? <coughs> Mr. Buckner, what was it? <coughs> Almost. It's on the derivative equals zero or it's undefined. It's a little bit more than just zero. Typically, it'll just be equal to zero unless you have some fraction and you'll have to set the denominator equal to zero. But yes, that's a critical point. So we need to know that definition to start this problem, that a critical point is when the derivative equals zero or it's undefined. Well, let's go ahead and find the derivative using the product rule again. So the derivative of the first times the second plus. I need to take the derivative of e to the kx, okay, again. It's an outside and an inside. The outside is e to the power. The inside is kx. k is just a value. So kx is derivative will just be k. So the derivative of the right piece would be e to the kx times k times the derivative of the first piece, which is x squared. And I get that. Well, I'm told that this is equal to zero when x is a half. What I can do is plug in a half for x everywhere and then solve for k. So let's do that. This is just going to be e to the one half k because the two times the one half go away. And this will be e to the one-half k times k times a fourth. And that equals zero. What should I do now? Factor out an e. This is a common occurrence when dealing with e's. I can factor out e to the one half k, giving me one. Don't forget to know that that is one after we divide it out, and then one fourth k equals zero. Once again, e to the one half k will never equal zero, it will always be positive. So we don't worry about that piece. It'll never help the entire expression equal zero. Thank you. All right. Well, then we get 1 plus 1 fourth k is equal to zero. I solve for k. I subtract 1. I get 1 fourth equals negative 1. 1 fourth k equals negative 1. k is equal to negative 4. Voila. Okay, different type of problem, a little tricky, 
Super tricky, all these problems, if you don't know that if you factor out this, and you know this is always positive, uh, the, the problem would be really tough for you to figure out. Okay? So we kind of forget about it and go from there. Well, let's move into unit three. Unit three is, hey, when is a function decreasing? When is it increasing? When is it concave up? When is it concave down? I can look at functions involving E's and, figure out, and I can figure out whether it's increasing or decreasing. We will set our critical points, we'll find our critical points, and then we'll use our favorite number lines that we thought we didn't have to worry about anymore to help figure this out. So we know that a function is decreasing when its derivative is negative. Let's find the derivative and figure out when it's negative. How do I figure out when something's negative? Set it equal to zero. Examine the signs around the zeros. can even factor out an x and an e to the x. I don't want to do that, though, because I don't want to confuse you. I'm just going to factor out the e to the x, and I have 2x plus x squared. Then I could factor this. I can have it look like that, or I can have it look like different terms, whatever you want. Then I get my two solutions, knowing that this is always positive and never zero. I get x is equal to zero or negative two. Well, now, after I get that, I will examine the signs of f prime around those two values. Again, don't forget, e to the x is always positive. Since e to the x is always positive, you don't even have to worry about it. You can almost exclude it and use test points in x times 2 plus x. So I use a test point like 1. We got a positive times a positive. Times a positive, e to the x. I use a test point like negative 1. I get a negative times a positive. I get a, a test point like negative 3. This will be a negative times a negative. Again, times a positive doesn't matter. Boom. I get my answer from negative 2 to 0. Okay, remember, test points, you just have to pick one point, and then you know all of the signs of your function that you're looking at. Here, we're looking at the derivative, f prime. We'll know all the signs of f prime if we just look at one point, as long as these are all the zeros that we find. That's how we figure out how a function is negative or a function is positive find the zeros, and then test the signs. Let's find the concavity of that function when x is 6. Why just x is 6? Why not just say, when, is, when are we concave up? Change the question. Maybe it's not a question that's conducive for this function, but we'll find out. When is f of x concave up? I don't know. We'll find out. Now, concavity, remember, we have to look at our second derivative. we got to figure out when the second derivative is positive. My first derivative using the product rule, and yeah, this will work, is that, that simplifies to be just log x plus 1. And then I take the second derivative, and I just get 1 over x. Well, we need to set this equal to 0 or 
see when it's undefined, we get one critical point for that second derivative when x is 0. We then look around 0, and you usually look to the left and to the right of 0, and you always say, oh, this will be a negative for sure, and this will be a positive. However, Is one. Don't you take the derivative? One over x times x. So I use this as a product. I use the product rule here. So derivative oh, yeah. first times oh, yeah. second plus the derivative second times the first. Okay, cool. All right. So I see it's negative. That means it's concave down when x is left. Uh, less than zero and it's concave up. So we are concave up when x is greater than zero. Uh, however, there's something wrong here. Log x, if we look back at log x, log x looks like this. It is only defined when x is greater than zero. This piece I actually wouldn't care about because log x does not exist when x is less than or equal to zero. You can't find the log of zero. You can't find the log of negative 1. It's impossible. So in this situation, we're just looking to the right of 0, and we find out that we are concave up there. Okay? That works out well. All right. Another one with logs. We have negative x log x. When is f decreasing? Again, product, use the product rule. And we're going to use our number lines. Just powering through these examples. Does that work? Should it be x log x? Doesn't work. Nope, it works. Never mind. How do I solve this? Add one, isolate the log. Log of x is equal to negative 1. How do I solve this for x? What do you do, Mr. Reynolds? Yeah, e to the power of both sides, giving me x is equal to e to the negative first, which is the same as 1 over e. Now, this is a great example because on my number line, First, we're going to be starting at 0. It's important to know that we're talking about x is greater than 0. So i got to start at 0, and I have 1 over e. And this is my derivative right here. What would be a test point that I'd, I'd use between 0 and 1 over e that makes sense? That actually can be used in the log of x. I don't want to pick like one tenth because I don't know what the log of one tenth is. I don't know how it relates to negative one. Ideas? Ah, beautiful. Another power of E that ends up being a smaller fraction, like one over E squared or one over E cubed, one over E to the tenth. Because I know this is the same as e to the negative third. Well, I could plug in e to the negative third. Negative log of e to the negative third minus 1. 
that is just going to be the opposite of negative 3 minus 1. The opposite of negative 3 is positive 3. Positive 3 minus 1 is positive 2. I'm positive there. Now, a value greater than 1 over e, 1, e squared, powers of e are what we use. Or just e, e to the first, e squared, e to the tenth. We always want to use powers of e when our derivative has log in it. Okay? Write yourself a note if you need to remember that. Use powers of e if f prime has L on it. Okay? So I use e squared. Log of e squared is 2. It'll be negative 2 minus 1, which is negative 3. Boom. So when are we decreasing? When x is greater than 1 over e. We'd be increasing from 0 to 1 over e. Okay? So between 0 and 1 over e, e to the negative third. It's perfect 1. E to the negative second. Uh, I'll come back to this one. We also could do implicit differentiation, last unit, with E's and logs. So really, it's just a review of everything we've done with E's and logs, which I love doing so that we don't lose track of everything. I like doing it at this time rather than fitting in E's and logs into unit 2 and then unit 3 and then unit 4. So let me just rewrite this as e to the x minus e to the y. Okay, we'd have to take the derivative of both sides with respect to x. And we would get e to the x minus, what's the derivative of e to the y? It would just be e to the y times dy dx equals, I have to use the product rule for xy cubed. Use the product rule. Then I need to understand that e to the fourth is just a number. And the derivative of that number would just be zero. That's a common mistake made. They would say that the derivative of e to the fourth is e to the fourth. It's actually zero. So using the product rule, I get that. Uh, I messed up. D dy dx here. Times x. Move all your dy dx is onto one side. Move everything else to the other side. Factor out of dy dx, divide to solve. Now, let's look at the next set. I'll show you this on the video. I'm going to do that example that I didn't get to, this example, and then another example over here. If I have log of a quantity, there's two ways to do this. We could either distribute after we take the derivative, or we could actually change the function. I'll look at this one over here. I could take the derivative of this one. I'd get 1 over x plus y, 
but then I need the derivative of x plus y, which is 1 plus dy dx. That will equal the derivative of this. Now, this is where it's tricky because if I multiplied both sides by this x plus y, this dy dx would kind of get stuck. I actually kind of need to distribute this, but that's not going to be beautiful. I could do it. There's another way to do this same problem. If I have the log of x plus y is equal to e, uh, sorry, xy, I'm looking ahead. Before taking the derivative, I can manipulate the function by taking e to the power of both sides. Because I know e to the log, I can do, it's just x plus y, and this is e to the xy. This may be nicer when I take the derivative. Watch out, it'll be a little bit nicer, at least to solve. I don't have to distribute and have dy dx's on both sides. I'll just have 1 plus dy dx is equal to e to the xy times 1y plus dy dx x. I do have to distribute the e to the xy, but maybe it's a little bit nicer. It's just an option for you to do. You may see this in your book done. You can use it or not use it. I guess either way we would have had to distribute. But it is a way to kind of change the problem up. Sometimes it will make things easier. Okay, I will have uh, a couple more examples for you at the end of this video if you want to watch them. Please keep track of um, your homework. Your homework is over like three different sections. Please keep track of which section you're on and when. All right, I'll see you guys on Monday. Have a good weekend. Let me go back and do this one. Now, solving fairly quickly, I'll get this. which is not beautiful. I would probably prefer this guy as an easier answer. Let's look at this guy as just a regular standard derivative, and then we'll do the other. So we just want to find the implicit derivative. I'll take the derivative get 1 over x minus 1 over y dy dx is equal to dy dx. Subtract this and subtract that. I'd have dy dx uh, 1 over y, negative 1 over y dy dx minus dy dx is equal to negative 1 over x. Factor out and divide would give me negative 1 over x over negative 1 over y minus 1. Okay, not pretty, but it is the derivative. Again, I factor it out. This would be negative 1 over y minus 1. Divide that by that. Boom. Okay, back to this previous example. When is this function decreasing and concave up? Okay, so I have to do both my first derivative and my second derivative. My first derivative, again, we have a composition, so it's the derivative of the outside, which ends up just being the inside times the derivative of the inside. I'm going to set that equal to zero or see when it's undefined. Well, we're always going to know that x is going to be greater than zero because I have log x in it. So I need to figure out when log x over x really just equals zero. 
So that's when uh, x is 1. So again, you have to figure out when log x is equal to 0. Take e to the power of both sides. You get x is equal to 1. e to the 0 is 1. So for f prime, I will be looking, starting at 0, going to 1. I'll pick a value like 1 over e or e to the negative first. I'll plug that in. e to the negative first will give me negative 1 over. This will be a positive. So this would end up being a negative. And then over here, I would check like e, log of e is 1, 1 over e, positive. Okay, so that's f prime. Let's look at f double prime. I'd have to use the quotient rule to find the derivative of f prime. So it'd be the derivative of the top times the bottom minus the derivative of the bottom times the top, all over the bottom squared. That gives me 1 minus log x over x squared. Again, I set that equal to 0. I know I'm starting at 0, but I also have 1 minus log x equals 0. So that's when log x is equal to 1. Take e to the power of both sides, I get x equals e. So for my second derivative, we're focused around e. And I'll move that over just a little bit. And, again, I start at 0, so I need a value between 0 and e. Again, I can use 1 over e. This is the same as e to the negative first. If I plug in e to the negative first, I get negative 1. So 1 minus negative 1 would be 2. This will be positive. If I pick a value like e squared, e squared would be the log of e squared is 2. So 1 minus 2 is negative 1 over e squared squared. That's also positive. So it's negative divided by a positive. That's a negative. So when are we decreasing n concave up? We are decreasing between 0 and 1. We're concave up between 0 and e. So that means we'd be decreasing n concave up right here between uh, 0 and 1. Okay, very good problem. Thank you, Mr. Mester, out.